I think well, um, we're going ahead and introducing our first speaker, and that's um, Dr. Fred Graham. Is that correct, Kasia? Just to make sure I'm on track. And he's got a presentation he's going to uh, give to us. And we might, you might want to pose some questions, think of some questions, and towards the end of the three speakers we have, you can uh, pose those questions to us in the panel. Thanks, Fred. Well, thank you very much. It's, a, it's really a privilege to be here. I come from you, uh, to you from Brisbane or Turrbal country. And um, I sort of probably gonna talk about how I got to where I am and some of the work I've done on the way. I'm actually a gerontological specialist in hospitals. So by buying, being in hospitals, I am sort of on the receiving end of things that go on in the community. So I do outreach to the community in various capacities. Um, as well so um but my passion and i'm probably going to throw a bit of controversy straight out here at the moment is there's a big policy decision right now around antipsychotics my passion is around actually reducing responsive behaviors in people with dementia in any setting but i've been mostly concentrating that on that in um hospital settings over most of my career um i'm a bit worried about policy uh, positions which only concentrate on reducing antipsychotics which i think are myopic and it's been written about it's failed in the states um which and the reason i'm i don't absolutely i absolutely agree it's there's an overuse issue <laughs> that's not the problem but only concentrating on not using them absolutely devalues the amount of work real work that has to happen around reorganizing our care settings so we have therapeutic environments and we deliver the care that doesn't require psychotropics. So um, to that end, that's been my passion for probably the last 10 years, looking at the environments, the models of care, and most importantly, capacity building staff to do the care. But I have not always been a uh, nurse. In fact, I'm only a recent nurse for those people. And so I'm gonna talk a bit about my career because I think what's important is if you're passionate about something and you love it, and you use your brain a bit and you measure it, all the little things you do, then you can just, you know, you develop. You can only do what you can do. So I'm actually a musician in my other life. I trained as a musician. I was a professional musician for a long time, retrained as a nurse. That was um, me and my band in August this year. Still play a lot over in France, that was. So we have a good time and it's a really good break from being a nurse. <laughs> so uh, there's another shot of that. So I started, I actually graduated from nursing in 2004, and I won't tell you exactly how old I am, but that was a while ago now. Um, but I was probably, you know, uh, not that young at the time. Um, and then after a first year, I became a CN. I, was, I, I, be, I became a nurse on um, acute medical wards in a big public hospital. And um, over a period of time, we, we were looking and we're saying, we could, should be able to do this better. Um, you know, the care, it, I was on a ward where there was, a lot of people, it was a repository for a lot of people who had cognitive impairment and behavioral disturbance in the hospital. And then there became this opportunity to set up a, a new model of care. So I, suddenly I, there was an act, I, I became the acting NAM. We moved a few wards around and we did some redesign and we set up a co-location strategy, but it was a model of care. And at the time I thought we should be measuring this in some way. And so we did, and it wasn't a research study. It was more a quality improvement study but we developed these things called, you know, sunflowers that talked about, you know, sort of some person-centered things. We developed a pain. Um, that was a poster there we did of the, of the um, high care strategy. So we did put all these different elements around what, what um, person-centered care might look like in a, in a not an op ideal environment, but what can we do with what we've got? And actual fact, we, on three medical wards, we actually reduced falls in people with cognitive impairment on those three medical wards over two years by 30% and specials by 60%. And we, have, we had a few more staff in this area and we had some resources rather than reading for, reaching for psychotropic medications, you could reach for other things like recreational um, activity. But there was a whole lot of training that became involved. Interestingly, I, I, we presented that over in um, America at the Magnet Conference. And then recently, um, Sinvani and colleagues did a study on exactly this model, actually, in a bunch of New York hospitals and found that they had, a, you know, this is what we didn't do at a robust level, um, but they had a more robust level of actually saying it had positive outcomes. And so, you know, then this thing, this dementia thing, and I can't say I've always wanted to be a nurse and I love being a nurse and I've always wanted to care. I'm not that person. 
It was a way of propping up my music habit. But anyway, but I'm a bit of an enthusiastic person. So anything I see, I, I have this crying sense of injustice, which I was seeing a lot of. Um, so somehow this dementia thing followed me around because we needed to write an education module. And then there was an acting nurse educator position. So I did that. And then we got on to um, I, a clinical nurse consultant position for dementia came up for the hospital. And th what became really clear to me was nobody knew what I was talking about when I was writing in notes. So I had to do this big education strategy across the hospital, write a module, actually personally educated for two hours, <laughs> 800 nurses individually over four months. And in that process, um, a bunch of nurses said, oh, I get this. And so we said, well, let's start a Cognition Champions. Just you, you're passionate about it. What can you change on your ward? And so, and we also, at the same time, we're developing an education package for Dementia Training Australia, which was an, I was actually the facilitator for that. And it was like giving these 20 minute little education deliveries to nurses and occupation, uh, uh, allied health on wards in a medical ward environment. And we published a bit on that. It didn't quite fully achieve, uh, get through the whole study for various reasons of, re about research. But that led to two things. The education strategy we've done across this hospital in CogChamps led to us winning a, uh, actually that's wrong, it's not 380, but it's about $200,000 grant from um, Department of Social Services at the time to examining whether these cog champs, these people who are passionate about practice on their wards, whether they can change practice. And then also the view from here was asked to be turned into an online module, which now is Proof to Dementia Training Australia and available to any hospitals who want to um, sign up for that. So, um, and then, you know, got another publication out, still haven't really done any research, just sort of doing a bit of quality and trying to measure a few things and being an advocate and taking any opportunity to talk about it to people and write about it. So we were invited to write about it and present at the Magnet Conference in um, Atlanta, Georgia in 2016. And then we got some publications out of the Cold Champs, which showed that a social, you know, peers influencing each other was really influential in getting some better ways of detecting delirium and a few things. It wasn't so good. We, and in this program, we, we wanted to get um, them to have action plans. But one really, if I was putting a key thing in the education of clinical nurses champions was to actually spend about two hours on how to run a meeting. Because most of us nurses, we hit the floor running from about 7 to 3.30 and we go home. And they had a great time when we had a meeting. They just loved talking about all these things they do and nobody could hold themselves to account and none of that happened for half of them. So just organising a meeting, making sure, because often when you become a grade seven nurse, that's when you really have to learn this, right? You've got things to achieve before, you've got homework to do before your next nursing. So, you know, big complicated study. No, not that complicated, but, you know, key outcome, make sure people know how to run a meeting, I think is a really good idea. And then we also published a little bit on the view from here, which is that's just some ideas about those things. So then we also, you know, been training all these cog champs, but at the same time, we had all our AINs saying, well, we're just left on our own, specially on our own, no handover given and this. So we did a little study on that, a really sort of dirty little study, but we want to have this sneaking suspicion that clinical nurses and RNs don't know how to do this care. They don't know how to write about it, and they certainly don't know how to delegate it to a special. And the, so they leave the specials to do it. And in a way, we did a, a sort of we did a little um, survey of all these specials. Only 30 of them percent of them actually got a handover about the care they were about to deliver to somebody. And at the end of the day, none of them handed back over to the um, the RNs. And most of them didn't have a care plan that was actually around person-centered care around behavior that was all very functional about how you do toileting and things like that, which isn't going to stop any behavioral disturbance and it's certainly not going to stop falls. So that was um, that was starting that discussion, and this is woefully poor. If you want to, if you're a if you're a passionate nurse right now in acute care, get into this space because this is woefully poor literature. And um, you know, I'm looking forward to Miriam Coyle's PhD there, Vicky, um, and I've been reaching out to her because I'm very passionate about this. It's just woeful. Um, that some of the most dangerous situations people are in in hospitals as staff are actually in these situations, and we're leaving our least trained people. So we did a little little um, publication on that. And then the high care, we, we got to a point where we actually decided to build a new environment for eight patients on our wards, and we call it acute cognitive unit model of care. And that's what it looks like. And that's using for independently people, people who've got dementia, who are independently mobile, who've got quite severe BPSD. 
or behavioural and psychological symptoms. So we wanted something that was more home-like. It's still on the hospital grounds. We, we definitely didn't want it to, we wanted a garden area and we had a quite a, quite a, a model of care there. And we've been measuring that and I'm just at the end of data collection and I've got a small grant to measure this 25,000 and um, we're showing massive drops within the first week of patients moving across from the acute sector into this unit just in aggression and agitation and a whole lot of scores. So we'll be hopefully publishing on that next year. So, and what's really important that, about that is the environment is incredibly important, but so is the model of care. One or the other, you can't do it without each of them. And all along at the same time in my career, I started a PhD, which took me nine years. And I'm gonna just take a, about two or three minutes to explain a little bit about that, because I'm very, quite passionate about that. My passion was around why why is it that the nurses are missing, you know, what I would consider basic triggers to behavior and moving straight to psychotropics or other things and just missing things like pain that's behind agitation in people with dementia. It could have been a whole lot of things. Um, you know, it could have been urinary retention. I chose pain because I thought that was an easy one in one sense is you can get analgesia and it potentially solves a problem. But I wanted to look at the problem, not through a pedagogical lens, which um, I found some research saying, look, you know, if you can go and educate everybody and run these workshops and it doesn't do anything. And nobody, very few, there's a systematic review, very few people actually use a cognitive science lens. And yet everything we know about change practice and practice and performance is got a whole cognitive science lens in it. So that's what I wanted to take on. And, um, you know, for those who know about pain and dementia, it's aggression and agitation can be absolute signs of it. Um, nurses don't do very, neither do other health professionals do very good at because it relies, we often rely too much on self-report. All the pain guidelines, all the guidelines, you know, there they are, all say prioritise pain and give you four, sent, four word sentences about it. And that's probably the hardest assessment you're going to do in clinical practice, actually. And, um, and only a couple of studies had actually looked at it and said, well, we seem to be missing pain in people with clear injuries. So I had a sort of a clinical um, lens, a, a conceptual framework around cognitive science, which was this idea that there's this fast automatic processing that you develop as an expert, that sort of pattern recognition, if, if you will, and another analytical type of thinking. There's a whole bunch of theories that explain that, that explain the same thing. And they're over there on the right of the screen. Um, but we also know that the that learning these things and um, uh, you know on wards is actually very much around socio-cultural factors in the workplace, routines, community of practice, and narratives. So that's a big influence on perhaps your clinical lens. So we set up a virtual simulation and we measured all these clinical factors through a knowledge survey after you finish this simulation. So that was my study. It's sort of a method. We were measuring the performance of nurses in the simulation. And it was a simulation about a person with, who had no obvious physical signs of pain. They weren't frowning or growling or limping, but they were very agitated and they had an injury. They got very agitated. So, you know, there's a bit of what it looked like. It's quite sexy, like there's a video and there's an avatar that can talk to you, you know, and then there's all these things and it's like choose your own adventure, very complicated. That's, it took me three years to do the design and program 20,000 words to say for this guy. But probably the key thing that really gets me interested is um, that that tacit experiential knowledge, this unconscious classification of available cues, impacted the RN's ability to recognize pain related agitation way more than their formal disease based knowledge. 98% answered correctly that agitation was a sign of pain, and yet five, only less than 5% actually got this right. 13 people out of 274 nurses, very, very generalizable sample. If I had gone into hospitals and done a workshop on pain, I would have failed miserably. This really turns our whole idea of education and how we become expert in practice on its head. We've got to do it in practice or in simulation. <laughs> it's got to be repeated practice. It's got to be accurate, immediate feedback about your performance and healthcare situations are wicked places to actually get accurate intuition or pattern recognition. And an editorial on the paper with this was also flagging that they'd done a bunch of this in simulation where, um, where you had actors, but that's prohibitively expensive. So the idea of using virtual simulation may have, hit, may have hit something on there. So that's my passion. In the future, I want to get a big grant and build these big simulation suites to do this. But 
at the moment, I've got this grant to finish off with the acute cognitive model of care, but then I've got another one around cognition support um, plans, getting the whole MDT on wards to enact a cognition support plan quickly. Um, and that's the dots are about my timelines there. And then there's another one around experiential placements, a bit taking off some of the lessons from the PhD where CNs come and work in my service for five weeks and we go back into their hospital and measure whether that has an impact in their wards on the care of cognitively impaired patients. And we actually stage it so there's three CNs from each ward and they come back five weeks after another. So it's a stepwise design. So I'm very, we're just getting that off the ground now. And I'm very happy to say I just won a $300,000 um, fellowship, which is actually to examine this pain related agitation, the one that doesn't look like pain related agitation, and to try to see how prevalent it is because we actually don't know. And so you can see that my body of work and my journey is all around this capacity building healthcare workforces and systems to prevent and manage agitation in cognitively impaired patients. My reflections, and my this is my final slide, is um, you know, always think about what it is that could make things better in your work, that the work and the outcomes for your patients. Do not, you know, do not do everything, just the things you can do. Your sphere of influence will grow. Mine has grown a lot and I started small. Find something you love about what you do and keep doing it. And always think about how you might measure and report the quality improvements that you undertake. I think nurses don't do this well. And so I think nursing needs to actually report the value of its work, measure it and report it no matter how small. And thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. May, may your passion generate many ripple effects, which I think it has done. Um, that's fantastic. Um, I, you made me think of the idea that I've had for a long time about what I call cross fertilization from acute, which really is secondments across acute into residential aged care or even community aged care and primary health care to share the learnings. But um, Yeah, that's I'm a sure lovely that idea. I wish I could do that. There's so many obstacles about that and governance, but if we could just break that down, it would be wonderful. That's right. That's right. I mean, if, we, if we've got uh, um, people from the federal government, the chief nurse still on, you know, it's, it's about that state commonwealth divide. Um, but the ripples of your passion um, uh, will reverberate and thank you. And, and I think that's where Ghana is going to be wonderful is that they we're going to have lots of people with passion to, to continue this. Thank you. Thank you.